Welcome to our webinar, Becoming Who We Are, The Importance of Individual Differences in Infant Temperament. My name is Andrea Jimenez. I am the program coordinator at Global Connections. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Maria or Masha Gartstein. She is a professor from the Department of Psychology at WSU. Um, so the presentation will be around 45 minutes long. We will have time for questions and answers at the end, but you are free to write your questions at any point in the chat box. Um, again, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, let me know. And thank you so much for coming. I will now pass it on to Maria. Great, thank you. Ordinarily, I would be doing this from my office and you could see me a lot clearer, but um, you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm in my home office and uh, it's a little bit less conducive to these kinds of meetings. So um, the title of my talk is Becoming Who We Are, The Importance of Individual Differences in Infant Temperament. And I have been studying temperament and I have been an infancy researcher for a little over 20 years now, which seems just, you know, unfathomable. I would have never guessed that I would have stuck with it for this long. So, but the reason why I have is that it's such a multifaceted um, construct and its ideology of where it comes from is so complex. It's related uh, with brain activity. It's certainly related with uh, parenting and parent-child interactions in a bi-directional reciprocal sort of way. It is itself a predictor of a variety of important outcomes for us to study. So um, it's kept me busy all this time for those reasons. So what I wanna do today is, um, I want to run through some slides with you. I'm going to talk about um, definitions of temperament. I'm going to talk about um, how we measure it. I'm also going to talk about some findings related to how temperament develops, um, how um, parenting is involved in that. Um, I'll present some of my cross-cultural work on um, differences in temperament development around the world. And my current work actually has to do with looking at underlying brain activity, also bringing parenting into that picture. So we'll probably finish off our chat with that and I'll keep an eye on the time so that I do leave some time for you to ask me questions. So in terms of defining temperament and understanding what it is, at least conceptually, you know, the construct has been around for a really long time. Um, you're not seeing it full screen, I'm not sure. That's something I can fix, but I will, oh, I need to go into my presentation mode, I think. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can do this. Slideshow, there we go, that should do it. Okay, so it's been around for a long time as a construct, but, um, you know, so as my slide said, uh, there's some thinking about it back in the Greco-Roman period. But um, in terms of thinking about temperament in childhood, this is a fairly recent endeavor. And, you know, initial observations were made in studies that were actually focused on motor development and uh, researchers like Gazelle and Shirley essentially sort of said like, gosh, not only are these babies um, sort of growing in terms of their motor abilities, but look at the individual differences and how they react to situations and people and that sort of thing. Isn't that interesting? And so um, it is in fact interesting. And um, back in um, 1960s, Thomas and Chess were really the first researchers to ask questions about temperament in childhood and how it might be related to things that happen down the road. And um, they began what is referred to as a New York Longitudinal Study. Um, their primary achievements with respect to this study, well, first and foremost, they were the first to demonstrate that temperament as early as the first year of life actually translates into risk versus protection for symptoms, disorders, you know, mental health related issues in adulthood. They followed these infants into their early adulthood, um, you know, and so measured those outcomes. And so they identified a temperament constellation they referred to as difficult temperament, which has to do with basically distress proneness and, and poor regulatory capacity. And so those were the children that in their studies were at greater risk compared, for example, to um, children they identified as being easy in terms of their temperament. With respect to goodness of fit, this is this idea that if you really want to understand um, how children will be at risk versus protected, again, for these mental health related outcomes, 
it's not enough just to ask questions about their temperament or measure their temperament. You have to also understand um, their context from the standpoint of how they're being parented. And so, you know, the way that parents are able to approach their child in terms of their demands and expectations really matters. If they're able, if you have a child who's really distress prone, but their parents kind of recognize this as their temperament and are able to work with it effectively, they will not face um, as much risk down the road as a child who does not have that kind of goodness of fit going forward. Now, I do want to tell you that in all honesty, children who are easy, it's far easier as a parent to achieve goodness of fit with them. It takes a lot more work for parents to provide this goodness of fit for kids who are, you know, who are sort of on the fussy end of the spectrum. Um, there's also an Eastern European tradition of temperament that doesn't get often get mentioned very often, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but I do want to tell you that uh, Pavlov, who's always associated with classical conditioning and salivating dogs, was actually a temperament researcher, and he was actually really interested in individual differences around um, this learning. Um, so that was his primary area of research. Well, the most cited uh, temperament model today is the psychobiological temperament model, which is going to be at the heart of what we will be discussing. And it defines temperament as constitutionally based individual differences. And these differences encompass reactivity and self-regulation. So constitutionally based, uh, you know, traditionally people interpret this as genetically based, but it's really just biologically based. And so some of that biology may in fact be your genetic predisposition, what you inherit from your parents, but some of that biology is likely prenatal effects that are actually environmental effects. For example, stress the mom experiences when she's pregnant because it is um, transmitted to the offspring sort of molecularly um, through, you know, through initially changes in her physiology, then um, through the uterus um, and the placenta. So um, that's the constitutional piece. Reactivity is emotional reactivity, activity level. And um, these differences are influenced over time. I already mentioned heredity, also maturation and experience. So brain development, of course, really shapes how temperament comes online. And experience is where parenting comes in. Temperament is um, thought to be the core of the developing personality. And so when I started to do this work, um, one of the things that drew me to working with infants was um, research suggesting um, that in fact, um, these individual differences in infancy were the foundation for who we were to become as adults. And I'm not saying to you that, you know, the way somebody is when they're six months or 12 months is exactly how they are in their 20s or their 40s, right? That would be crazy. But uh, somebody who is very reactive as an infant tends to be a reactive adult. Somebody who is behaviorally inhibited and so is very cautious to approach new things. That's a behavioral style. That's a temperament constellation that tends to persist into adulthood. And temperament itself develops. And of course, one of the reasons why it develops is because the underlying brain structures themselves develop, right? That's that maturation piece. And also it develops based on the inputs from the environment, the contextual factors. In the first year of life, those contextual factors are primarily parenting. So how do we measure temperament? Well, another thing that really attracted me to working with infants is this added degree of difficulty. They can't tell us anything about themselves, right? So we have to be very clever in how we gather this information. So one thing we can do is we can ask parents questions. And we have to do this really carefully because parents of babies are tired and they're not super objective because obviously they're invested in the outcomes of their hard work as parents. And so you have to ask um, questions in a very particular and careful manner. You have to ask about very recently occurring things like only the past week or two. You have to ask about very concrete behaviors like in the past week when you're bathing Johnny, you know, how frequently did he smile or laugh? And you have a little Likert scale, a seven point scale for them to use. Um, you can really minimize a lot of um, sort of a response sets or biases by taking this approach. And so Mary Rothbard, who was my postdoctoral advisor at the University of Oregon, invited me to revise her infant behavior questionnaire, which had been very widely used. And I, of course, said yes. And so we wrote some additional items to create um, more scales. And then we evaluated these items and scales uh, psychometrically, as they say, which really just means that 
we had to demonstrate that in fact the scales work the way that we anticipated they would, that they actually measure the, um, the constructs, the attributes that they were designed to measure. And so um, some of that work is, a, is achieved uh, via a statistical approach called factor analysis when we applied that approach to the data we had collected with the questionnaire, it long behold told us that our 14 scales formed these three overarching factors. And when we looked at the factors and their composition, um, their content, the first one um, we, was labeled as positive affectivity surgency, which is like the infant counterpart for what adult personality people call extroversion. So it's baby extroversion. Negative emotionality, which is what adult personality people refer to as neuroticism. It's essentially distress proneness. And then regulatory capacity or orienting, which is certainly not the same thing as, as conscientiousness, again, that's from the personality world, or what uh, researchers who work with older kids will call effortful control, because effortful control is all uh, really entirely based just about on executive functions. Well, executive functions uh, come online because of the maturation of the frontal lobes. That hasn't yet happened um, in the first year of life. It begins to happen towards the end. So it's a more primitive um, attention-based regulation, if you will. It's based primarily in orienting attention. And also you can see from the scales like suitability that parents and the way that parents are able to help their infant you know, to calm down is also a part of this early regulatory capacity. Well, what else can we do? Well, we can also observe babies when they come to the lab. And so together with some colleagues, actually at the University of Murcia in Spain, along with Mary Rothbard, we developed a set of procedures that are standardized procedures, which means that, you know, they're followed exactly the same um, every time. They're very specific instructions. We time things in a very precise way. But the idea is that we create these situations in the lab that are designed to elicit different types of reactivity. So um, Pickaboo, of course, is designed to elicit smiling, laughter, positive emotionality, right? Uh, we show masks um, because, um, not because babies know they're scary, because, you know, they haven't learned that yet. They haven't been through uh, that kind of associative learning, but uh, masks are unusual. And so it's really measuring um, this um, sort of distress to novelty, which is, of course, a, the foundation for fearfulness. Um, so we can present babies with these situations in the lab and measure their reactions by video recording them and then applying, again, a very precise kind of coding scheme in which we have to show our research assistants are reliable. And that means um, this is an interator type of reliability, probably more than you ever wanted to know about reliability. It has to do with how much people agree. Like if I think that baby's smiling, but it's sort of ambiguous and I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's a one. Somebody else looking at the same video has to agree that you know that number is, is the same number or um or it's not a good code and so that's what we do in the lab is we present these situations this is peekaboo and what mom does is she actually peeks through each one of these little windows and she opens it and looks at her baby and says peekaboo and babies really like it um so this is kind of you know obviously this is just a snapshot in time but you can see he's beginning to smile so that's how we observe temperament. Again, there's a very huge sort of quantification piece to it and a huge demand for measures to be consistent. And in the case of observations across um, observers and cross readers. So um, this is masks. You can allow my research assistants, you know, generally really like Pickaboo because, well, you know, it's nice, baby smile, they like it. Masks is one of the least favorites because it ruins everyone's hair. Um, but you can see mom is sitting off to the side and we tell the mom not to intervene. But of course, if she needs to soothe the baby, that's, you know, we don't preclude moms from doing that. So how do these measures hold up? Well, when we look at the questionnaire, um, it looks like, I'm not going to go into details on these numbers, but what it looks like is the scales and the factors we've constructed, you know, actually tap these attributes in a consistent way. All of the items hang together, as they say, and appear to measure the construct we were trying to measure. For um, the observation on measures, people do agree in terms of the ratings that they provide. One of our interesting findings with respect to looking at what we get in the lab versus what the parents report to us um, was that um, the lack of agreement actually in this case for fearfulness is related to parents' own attributes. 
So, um, and this is consistent with the literature. The literature is more about a depressed moms kind of overrating distress for their kids. In our case, um, this is a community sample that we're not talking about you know, clinical depression, but they rated themselves on negative emotionality, their own distress proneness, and moms who reported higher levels of negative emotionality um, overrated their babies on fearfulness relative to what we observed in the lab. And we thought that was kind of interesting. So um, let's talk about development. I promised you we would. I'm gonna show you some data showing the temperament and facts developed over time. This older paper from 2010 and this newer one from 2018. So what's interesting about growth modeling from the 2010 paper was that, so we measure temperament from four to 12 months. This is fearfulness. Um, and what we find is that um, the levels, so fearfulness increases across the first year of life. There's a big jump here in around 10 months. This is pretty consistent with the literature. Um, what we find here, what you can observe in this picture is that it tends to accelerate and ultimately be higher for girls than boys. And, um, you know, and, and this is one of the places where people find gender differences as early as the first year of life. There are far more gender differences with older kids, but in infancy, you do get them with fearfulness in this direction and with activity in the opposite directions with boys basically being rated as higher in activity. In this slide, you can see that the difference in fearfulness is also related to maternal depression. And what's interesting here is that um, this is another community sample. So this is not a clinically depressed sa sample of moms. These are moms who are rating themselves on a um, depression scale. And we're using the depression cutoff score that comes with that instrument to separate them into minimal versus moderate to high symptom groups. And so for those moms who rate themselves as moderate to high on depression, you can see how their babies um, increase in fearfulness earlier and ultimately attain higher levels of fearfulness. So maternal characteristics, um, you know, really do appear to shape temperament development. All right, oops, let's see. So this next study is a more recent study that um, was conducted based on data um, here from, you know, collected here locally in Pullman. And what I'm going to show you, first of all, this particular graph has to do with how fearfulness um, is increasing um, from eight to 10 months. And this is based on that mask observation I was showing you earlier. So, um, you know, I will kind of make a connection here to theories of development, right? Some of them are stage-like and others um, talk about more gradual developmental courses. This definitely is more reflective of sort of a stage increase um, where you're qualitatively different in terms of your fearfulness here at 10 months relative to eight. Now, um, there are multiple individual differences. This is what people call a spaghetti plot. So you can see that when we look across our 150 infants individually, they have rather different trajectories. But on average, um, you get this jump from eight to 10 months. You don't get this jump when you look at parent report and how parents rate their infants. This looks a lot more gradual. The way that I explain this finding is that it's parents are probably not the best rate judges of, of rapid growth for their children. So for example, with my daughter, I often have the experience of going to visit our grandparents who don't live nearby. And they're like, oh my goodness, she's grown so much, right? And I'm like, oh, really? So I think it, it's sort of in the parents' mind, it's a little bit more gradual, but when we observe them in the lab, we do get that significant increase from eight to 10 months. But again, even with parent report, you get a lot of individual variability around this um, trajectory of growth or this pathway of growth. Smiling and laughter also increases across the first year of life, but this is uh, far more gradual. And um, uh, there's, a, again, a great deal of individual variation. And parents, again, see a much less rapid kind of increase in this attribute compared to what we observe in the lab. So one of my conclusions based on this particular study was that, you know, because there's a big debate in the field as you know, what do we make, how do we make sense of when the lab and the parent report don't agree? Well, so one way based on our data is to understand it from the standpoint of parents' characteristics. Are these parents depressed? Are they high negative emotionality? Because if they are, they may be reporting more of that for their infants. But I think the other um, takeaway point is, um, you know, using the lab versus um, 
parent report, probably that, that judgment call depends on what you're wanting to measure. And if you really want to measure development, then the lab is probably better because it's more sensitive to those processes. At least our data suggests that, that it, those observations are. And you know, these are just some numbers that go along with that model testing that I'll spare you um, for the purposes of our conversation today. So one of the reasons I'm shifting gears now to talk about um, why we study temperament, um, I hope I've made a case that it develops over time, especially rapidly in the first year of life. One of the reasons we study temperament, as I mentioned in the context of the Thomas and Chess conversation, is that it predicts you know, mental health related outcomes. Well, I haven't had the luxury you know, of studying people from infancy into their 20s, but we did do the short-term longitudinal study where we uh, measured temperament um, with, the, with my uh, questionnaire, um, the IBQR, um, in the first year of life, and then we followed these kids up into the preschool period. So four and five, you know, that's how old they were when we asked parents questions about their symptoms. And you'll see slide one is for internalizing symptoms. Um, internalizing is a little jargony, so I'll sort of um, um, uh, unpack that for you. Internalizing is depression, anxiety, somatic concerns like tummy aches, headaches. And so you can see, you know, if the question is who is at greatest risk for um, um, having high internalizing symptoms, it is um, it is the kids who are both high in negative emotionality and low in terms of their abilities to self-regulate. So this is what people in the field call temperament by temperament interaction. So it's not just being distress prone, it's being high negative emotionality or being distress prone plus having deficits in terms of being able to regulate oneself that translate into higher internalizing problems later in childhood and also higher externalizing problems. Very similar pattern here and externalizing problems are um, under controlled problems. So aggression, um, impulsivity, inattention fall into this category. So again, negative emotionality and regulatory capacity together predict these um, symptom and behavior problem oriented outcomes. So now I'm gonna shift gears into talking to you about my cross-cultural work. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the slide sort of setting this up. Um, I'll just say to you that um, I'll give you a very short background story on how I came to do this work. So I told you that um, um, I had um, developed this instrument with my postdoctoral mentor, Mary Rothbard. Um, and um, you know, because she has been a famous researcher and has really contributed to this field, it became really widely used. I think it was more of her contribution there than mine. But I certainly benefited from it. And one of my collaborators, um, Sam Putnam, who is in um, Bowdoin College in Maine, uh, was her postdoc after I left Eugene and University of Oregon. And he continued, um, he actually followed up my babies and studied them as toddlers and preschoolers, for which I'm really grateful. And he continued to do this work also, we collaborate to this day. One of the things that he had done, which is truly amazing, is that he took charge of disseminating all of Mary's questionnaires, including the baby one. And so um, he has a website where researchers who are interested go and, you know, they ask um, they request the measure, they provide their information, and then he shares um, the instruments with those who are, you know, sort of qualified to use them. And so at one point, and this has been some years ago, I think it was right before my daughter was born, like, so 2007, he shared the spreadsheet of these researchers with me. And I looked at it, and I just had this total aha moment, because I was, you know, it was every, like, researchers from around the world. And I said to him, oh my God, Sam, we have to collaborate with these people. They wouldn't be requesting our questionnaires if they weren't studying things that, you know, if they didn't have similar interests that we do. And so that's how this, this program of research began. And, and it's really all a function of these instruments being widely used. We were able to approach these, um, these collaborators. And of course, they were interested in running studies with us. And so I'm showing you the slide. You're like, why is the slide of WSU campuses? You know, what does this have to do with? Um, so one of the things that's funny in cross-cultural work is when I um, talk with my international colleagues, you know, and they're like, well, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, Washington State University. So first thing that they think is that I'm in Washington, DC. This is like, you know, time and time again. So then I'm like, no, 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 state of Washington. So then, of course, they think that I'm from Seattle. So uh, what I've started to do is when I present these data, I show the slide and I say to people, WSU, the primary campus is actually in Pullman, Washington, right? So here's Idaho, which is like as far east as you can go. And I also show them some photos of the lovely Palouse to just kind of ground them contextually 
in what it is to live here, to grow up here, right? And, um, and I also show slides of um, places around the world where our data have been collected for the same reason, to kind of ground people, you know, ecologically uh, with respect to where the data come from. So my Russian data set comes from Novosibirsk in Russia, which is consequential because Russia, just like China, if you go to Moscow or St. Petersburg, those are very uh, westernized places. And so they're going to be skewed in terms of the kinds of information that you get. Novosibirsk is uh, very old school uh, Russian to this day. I'll come back to some of these data, but I'll just kind of run through the places, highlight some of the places where we've collected um, data. I have another great collaborator in the Netherlands, in Nijmegen. And, um, so I've been fortunate to visit her and to work with her for a long time now. We more recently collected data in Ethiopia, which is probably one of the more exotic locations for our work. And although there is um, kind of an urban center that's in our at the data collection site, most families there live more rurally um, in these kinds of settings. And we were very grateful for them taking part in this work. So let me backtrack and, and highlight some of the findings from um, at least some of these projects. So in terms of the Russian data set, I think uh, my favorite study is this one from I think it was 2009 in European Journal of Developmental Psychology, where we basically showed that there's an interesting difference with respect to how infant temperament predicts this later self-regulation effortful control that I was talking to you about. And what this slide shows is that if you're a child growing up in the United States, if you smile and laugh more, um, as an infant, if you have more of this baby surgency, then you're gonna end up with higher effortful control as a toddler. But this doesn't make a difference for um, children who are growing up in Russia. And the way that we interpreted this finding is that smiling and laughter are so critical to moms in the US. And so there's something that they do to support regulation when their babies are able to um, you know, approach them, to interact with them with uh, greater positive emotionality. And you don't get that effect in Russia, presumably because there's less value placed on positive affectivity. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dutch babies. Dutch babies, um, after this paper was published, I got a lot of um, actually media requests to talk about um, this data set because what it showed was that um, Dutch babies, it was interpreted as Dutch babies are happier. But really what it is is that Dutch babies are less distress prone and they're better regulated. So the single biggest difference we get is on the soothability scale. So Dutch babies are far easier to soothe than babies in the US. Um, and babies in the US come out higher um, on um, those dimensions, those scales and attributes that have to do with um, negative emotionality. So for example, distress to limitations, which is frustration, fear. And by the way, in this initial paper, this is all based on mom's report, but we have done a follow-up study since then looking at dad's report and um, interestingly enough, it pretty much confirmed these original observations. So I feel good about reproducibility of these data. When we looked at our um, Ethiopian sample and how moms rated their babies here, we found quite a few differences and it tended to be in the direction of um, higher distress related kinds of dimensions for babies in Africa, um, but um, not uniformly because they were also higher on falling reactivity, which is babies' ability to lower their, their own level of distress. So it's kind of an interesting mix. I'm gonna skip this interaction effect in the interest of time. So what does this all mean? So kind of putting it all together because we've now studied temperament differences across a variety of cultures, and um, this particular graph that um, diagram that I'm going to explain here in a minute comes from our recent book, Toddlers, Parents, and Culture, which is a data book. So don't, don't look at it if you're not interested in data, but it looks at temperament and parenting across 14 different cultures. So, you know, to kind of give you a brief summary, essentially what we find is when we compare babies and toddlers and young children in the U.S. to those from Asian countries or Russia, we tend to see that babies in the US generally get higher ratings on things that have to do with positive affect. So again, that sort of baby extroversion, smiling, laughter, um, um, and um, 
higher and lower ratings on distress proneness. So babies from Russia, babies from Asia and Africa tend to get higher ratings um, with respect to distress related dimensions. However, when we look at Northern Europe, and I just showed you the, the Dutch data as an illustration of that, uh, kids from nor Northern Europe tend to be lower in distress relative to the US, and they also tend to be viewed um, as having greater regulatory capacity. So how do we understand these cross-cultural differences? What's really driving them? And so in this diagram, we kind of lay out our theory with respect to these um, factors that are behind, um, that are sort of the causal factors here behind this effect. So um, culture drives things like socialization goals and parental ethno theories. So socialization goals have to do with what do you want for your kid like what what do you value for them you know as um as they're growing up right is it important for you that they're respectful of adults that they obey authority is it important to you that they're you know a good leader um parental ethno theories are closely related um concepts that have to do with what does a good parent do does a good parent set a lot of limits on their child or does a, does a good parent let their uh, their child uh, sort of pursue their own interests to some extent. And um, that translates in turn into things. So, so these are cognitive things, right? This is parental psychology. These things are in the parent's mind. They translate into what parents do. They translate into daily activities. So if I value, you know, for example, you know, my kid growing up to be a leader, we're going, to, and I think that parents should give their children an opportunity to pursue their interests, we're going to have daily activities where my child can sort of practice those skills. I'm going to let them decide maybe what game they're going to play or what they have for lunch, um, right? And I'm going to give them that space to make those choices. Um, responses to temperament. Um, how do I respond when temperament displays are presented? In other words, when my kid is upset, when my kid is, uh, is uh, showing fear, what do I do? Do I cuddle them? Do I let them sort of cry it out and, and just sort of cope with it and um, lower their own level of arousal, right? Um, this, of course, is now more proximately related to temperament. And behavior problems, because as I was saying to you earlier, we have a lot of data that suggests, going back to Thomas and Chess, that um, temperament is an important factor that plays into whether or not we're on a trajectory of having sort of mental health and adjustment versus you know, struggling with um, things like depression, anxiety, aggression, and attention deficit hyperactivity. Okay, that was a shameless plug for my book. So what else have we done with temperament? And I know I'm kind of getting close to the end of the didactic portion of our meeting today. So I started my um, life as a researcher in psychology, working with pediatric populations um, as in graduate school. I spent most of my time in children's hospital in Cincinnati and um, looking at kids with chronic illness and their adjustment. And so I've, I've maintained some of that interest and we've looked at temperament in kids with Down syndrome and kids with fragile X. And for Down syndrome, we found something that um, is actually pretty consistent with the literature, which is um, these babies actually show lower levels of negative emotionality. And although that may seem like um, you know, sort of a, a, a temperament profile that's conducive to adjustment, in this case, um, it's interpreted as um, um, potentially limiting their cognitive development. And I'll tell you why that is very briefly. So distress to limitations recall is frustration. If I'm trying to solve a problem, if I'm working on a cognitive task, frustration is really important because when I feel frustrated, this is information that what I'm doing is not effective. So maybe I have to try a different solution, right? Maybe I have to get some help. So if you don't feel that, if, if that emotion isn't there, you're not motivated to pursue these strategies that will lead to um, effective problem solving. So for kids with fragile X, I will show you this um, uh, table or this um, figure very quickly. What we find in typically developing kids, now we're looking at negative emotionality, that sort of overall distress proneness. What happens over time with matched controls, which are healthy, typically developing children, is over time, as they get older, as they become preschoolers, they show less distress proneness. Why? Because they're better regulated. They develop that effortful control, that self-regulation that comes from maturation of the frontal lobes. Um, this is compromised in kids with fragile X. And what happens with them is that actually, as they get older, 
um, they present with higher levels of distress proneness. They're not able to regulate themselves effectively. And of course, that does play into um, compromised development with respect to um, adjustment and mental health. So just briefly, current projects, we're looking at um, EEG electroencephalogram uh, recordings um, as another data point because, of course, temperament is very closely related to brain activity, linked with brain activity. Our primary um, brain activity indicator is this EEG asymmetry. And um, asymmetry um, is this, so you, you already know, I'm sure, that brain is lateralized for a variety of functions. Um, a lot of people don't realize that brain is also lateralized for emotion. And so, and it's typically in the frontal area where you get this lateralization. What happens is um, those who are more, um, sort of have a greater tendency towards withdrawal, negative affect, and fearfulness tend to have greater activation in, on the right in the frontal lobes. And those who are more approach oriented, who present with higher positive emotionality, tend to have greater activation on the left. And there's a huge literature in children, adults, that really demonstrates that this is a pretty consistent and stable finding. So we look at this asymmetry and our um, experimental paradigm is we don't just look at it sort of when babies are relatively calm and alert, which people called baseline, we also look at it in the context of these manipulations where we cause um, distress or that are mildly stressful. And we've been using the still face paradigm, which briefly has to do with the mom presenting with a still face. It was developed to sort of mimic maternal depression. So they're not communicating and, um, and they're not presenting with any facial affect. So what we find, and this is where parenting comes into play again, is that for those babies whose moms are really intense and sort of overstimulating, they tend to have uh, this shift towards greater relative frontal activation, so greater avoidance, withdrawal, emotion, motivation in the context of that still face manipulation. And, um, and uh, babies, if, if they are in fact themselves sort of lower on baby extroversion or uh, surgency as we call it, right? So um, babies are um, sort of immune to the effects of maternal overstimulation if they're higher on surgency. And surgency is that big factor that I was telling you about. If we unpack it a little bit and look at one of its component scales approach, what we find is that, um, so babies who are low in approach, approach has to do with like really being into sort of going after things that are potentially rewarding or interesting. So for babies who are low in approach, they have that shifting to the right towards withdrawal um, during still phase when their moms tend to be uh, very intense and overstimulating in their interactions. But babies who are high in approach, actually, and this is a kind of trend level, it's not technically statistically significant, but you can see that, you know, the effect looks pretty meaningful in this graph. They tend to actually go towards left frontal activation. So the way that we interpret this is um, in the context of goodness of fit. So having these intense, potentially overstimulating interactions is not a problem, you know, does not cause this um, tendency to go into that sort of withdrawn negative emotionality um, brain activity mode for babies who are themselves um, are really in, sort of sensation seeking, right? It's sort of approach oriented. For them, it's a good fit. And when we look at brain activity, it translates into actually movement towards left and positive affect, even under a mild stressor. So we've interpreted this um, from the standpoint of that goodness of fit idea that how parents approach their infants, if it in fact is consistent in demands and expectations to what the baby or the child brings to the plate with respect to their temperament, that that's conducive to more positive outcomes. I'll show you one more brain picture and then we'll call it good. So um, in this slide, this is a picture of the brain. It's what's called a topo plot, and you can see it illustrates brain activity. And you can see this hot spot in the frontal right region. And you're seeing it this, uh, this brain activation in the context of that still face procedure I was just telling you about. So in still face, babies whose moms are um, more responsive tend to have a hot spot in brain activity on the right. What that actually means, because we're looking at alpha, everything is very complicated with brain activity. Alpha is a cortical rhythm that is inhibitory 
in nature. So um, a hotspot here actually means that the right side of the brain is being inhibited. So these babies are actually activated here on the left where you see the blue. So remember activation on the left is like sort of happy approach, um, things are good, right? So babies whose moms are more responsive, when we uh, present them with a mild stressor of mom's unavailability and still face, still are able to demonstrate this greater um, activation in the frontal um, left region that's associated with positive emotionality. So the punchline I think is that um, parenting um, really matters with respect to temperament and it matters with respect to temperament, whether we look at how it drives its development. So I was showing you the difference in fear trajectories for babies of moms who are depressed versus non-depressed. When I was showing you those other graphs, I forgot to mention that when we look at mother-infant interactions, more responsive moms tend to have babies who are lower in fearfulness. And moms who are more intense are potentially overstimulating. If we look at behavioral fear reactivity, those babies tend to increase in their fearfulness across the first year of life. So clearly parenting is a key factor in how temperament develops. And we find differences in temperament cross-culturally, which we think are ultimately a function of those contextual factors primarily related to how parents interact and approach their children. And when we sort of say, well, does this still work on, not at the behavioral level, but at the brain activity level, the answer is still yes, that how parents parents and approach their infants interact with them still makes a big difference. And I think I'm going to end with that and see if you have questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so, oh, we already have a question. Uh, so Celeste asks, when conducting international studies, did you encounter any challenges regarding cultural norms or other factors? She says, since I recently completed Psych 412 testing and assessment, I, I found your development of the IBQR very interesting. Um, there are challenges at every corner. I mean, anything that you do, when you do it uh, cross-culturally with this international component, there's an added degree of difficulty. So of course, when you're translating your instruments, you have to be really, really careful, right? And, um, and so you have to do what they call back translation, which means, so for example, with the Russian version of the IBQR, it was originally translated into Russian by my collaborator. Uh, I happen to be a Russian speaking person myself because I grew up there until I was 12 years old. So I was able to back translate it back into English. And then we compare that English version to the original version to see, you know, if, if, if it's close. I mean, and it should be, right? It should be like identical. Um, there's some items that don't work in all cultures. So when we were making the Ethiopian adaptation, in many ways, it was the hardest. Because, if, for example, for frustration, we have questions about like, what about, you know, does your baby get upset when when their movement is confined, like in a crib or a car seat, they don't have those things, right? So we had to eliminate a, a number of questions that just didn't uh, fit. Um, of course, um, you know, the way that you present the, the questionnaire. So in Ethiopia, a lot of those um, moms can't read and write. So the items had to be read to them in their native language. Um, how you recruit your samples, right? You're going to do it in the way that works in that particular location. So here, you know, we do it what, like through Facebook, through uh, birth centers. Um, that's not always the best approach. Um, you know, in Russia, my colleague approached um, daycares. Um, in the Netherlands, my collaborator there recruits uh, through midwives because everyone, you know, gets uh, free prenatal care and goes to midwives and, and, you know, gets a doula. So those are great resources for recruiting, of course, you know, during pregnancy. And then we collect the data from the infants once they're born. So um, going through numerous um, institutional review boards, right, because every, every place has their own and explaining the study to them in the way that makes sense. So it's challenging but it's very rewarding. Um, it's rewarding for one, uh, for one thing, um, you know, working with these international collaborators is amazing. Um, they're so devoted to their work and they're so interested in these partnerships and, um, and they just really make it worthwhile. And of course, visiting them is a lot of fun too. I will ask, in terms of the cultural differences that you, that you mentioned, do you think that is something that could change with time or is it pretty much ingrained in terms of how uh, parents 
you know, parent their children. Do you think that that's culturally ingrained or do you think that it could change in time with different, with more studies? So, okay, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm going to answer it like this. It has to do with um, how dynamic the culture is, right? And so that's often not a uniform kind of monolithic thing because different regions within different countries undergo change at different rates. I'll give you a very clear example of this. So in China, the traditional uh, finding, and this is Zinian Chen's research, he's now at University of Pennsylvania. The traditional finding is that um, Chinese children are rated as more uh, behaviorally inhibited or shy or fearful, right? But although that translates into maladjustment and internalizing problems here in the States, and those kids are seen as less socially competent in the States, they haven't found those negative kinds of outcomes in China. And the interpretation has been, well, Chinese don't really um, value extroversion and China being shy, shy and more timid is actually what's viewed as um, sort of the better alternative, um, in part because um, of their collectivistic way of thinking. You have to fit into the group. Um, you know, what's best for the group comes first, which means that, you know, if, if you're timid or shy and you're not a great leader, that's actually not a problem, right? So that's been the interpretation. But what has happened, like in the last, I'm going to say 10 years, is that urban centers in China, you know, they have become uh, very westernized, of course, because, you know, the commercial ties and lots of people come and study in the States. And so um, today, if you go to places like Shanghai or Beijing and you uh, measure these same attributes, what people find is that um, you don't get that sort of shyness bonus that we used to see back in the 80s and the 90s. Now, um, Chen says that you still have um, that it still works the same in more rural areas, which are not as dynamic and have not changed in terms of their values um, as much as the urban centers. But in urban areas in China, there has been this really dramatic shift in terms of um, how these attributes are valued. And, you know, arguably with, with a shift towards sort of viewing extroversion and leadership as a more positive set of traits. I Thank I you very answer. much. Yes. Um, let me see. Okay. It looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, I want to thank you all so much for coming once again. And thank you, Dr. Garstein, for presenting for us. This is very informative. You're so welcome. If you go to my website, it really, you know, it's pretty comprehensive and current in terms of presenting different work that's done in my lab. And if you think of questions later that you're not asking right now, um, you're welcome to email me and I will certainly respond. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was fun to do this. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye.